pirates are heavily associated with their iconic flag, the Jolly Roger. In its basic form, it's a black field with a skull, often with crossed bones, but the motifs are often replaced by other symbols of death, as are the colors. The flag became an important part of pirate tactics, signaling their intent in hopes of making the target surrender. But it's not like a pirate could order such a flag off the internet or get one from the convenience store. Back then, he'd probably be arrested for it. So they had to make their flags themselves. Sadly, we have little documentation of how and when pirates made their flags. They didn't exactly leave a handbook behind, leaving their procedure up to debate and speculation. This video will attempt to retrace their steps, when they made their flags, who made it, what materials they used, and where they got the inspiration for their symbols. It's necessary to begin with a short history of the pirate flag. Symbols of death and the color black have not always been associated with pirates. It only came to be in the early 18th century. Before then, use of such flags was scarce. Skull flags were allegedly used by the Barbary Corsairs. Papal ships were seen flying black flags with skull and bones to signal the death of an important figure. Cavalry regiments were also known to use the motif. The origins of the pirate flag are poorly documented and mysterious. Evidence points to it being invented by French filibusters, as the earliest sources point in their direction. But these sources are limited. The earliest account of pirates using such a flag was in 1688, when a company of French filibusters used it during a land engagement in Mexico. A red standard with a white skull and crossbones. Filibusters and buccaneers before them used similar banners, but this mortifying motif had not previously been documented in their hands. In 1700, an English frigate engaged a French pirate ship, commanded by Emmanuel Wynne. He flew a black flag with crossbones, a death's head, and an hourglass. This is the first known documented instance of the flag being black and being used at sea. Outside of this engagement, there is no information about Wynne. Most likely, he was a filibuster. Based out of Saint-Domingue, they were the French equivalent of the Buccaneers a colonial sort of paramilitary that pirated against national enemies. Traditionally, they had fought against the Spanish, but switched to the English in the late 17th century, when relations soured. In 1701, England and France went to war for 12 years, during which the filibusters augmented French forces. The final source pointing to filibuster origins is a French book of flags dated to somewhere between 1700 and 1710. It is the earliest known visual depiction of the pirate flag, and is attributed to the filibusters specifically. During this time, the filibusters were serving France. Regular pirates, who fought against everyone, including France, were distinguished from filibusters by being called Faubon. It doesn't appear in English hands until 1717, at the height of the pirate age in Nassau. When the war ended, English privateers grouped up in the Bahamas to continue their pirating activities against the French and Spanish. They primarily stole treasure from Spanish shipwrecks in Florida, but when the treasure ran out, many resorted to robbing their fellow Englishmen as well. This coincides with their sudden usage of black flags. In 1717, several crews used the black field with the skull and bones, including Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet. Captain Napin used a skull and an hourglass. Samuel Bellamy went with a skeleton blowing a trumpet, and Thomas Nichols a dart and a bleeding heart. Most likely, they had been using these flags before being documented as doing so. So, it seems like English pirates started using the French filibuster flag when attacking their fellow Englishmen. They would have associated these flags with filibuster attacks during the war. It is interesting to note that several pirates who claimed to never attack the English, like Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings, were never described as flying pirate flags. These guys basically claimed to be patriots and privateers. This could bolster the idea of the pirate flag's French origins. But it's just a theory, based on the known and available information. By 1726, black flags and mortuary motifs had become intrinsic to piracy as a whole. It became a symbol which the company could rally beneath, much like any national flag. In the 1720s, pirates called it Johnny Rogers, Old Roger, and eventually Jolly Roger. The latter has stuck around, but the meaning is uncertain and still debated upon. It appears as if pirates made their flags as soon as they turned on the account. 
a general history of the pirates relates how George Lothar and his crew, when turning to piracy, did the following. Renamed and modified their ship, wrote and signed their articles, prepared black colors. A similar account is given of Ned Lowe. The next day they took a small vessel and go in her, make a black flag and declare war against all the world. Of course, general history isn't the most reliable, but this seems highly plausible until an alternate idea can be presented and proven. The pirates would then need to assign someone to actually make their flag. I can think of four possible groups. The first and most obvious would just have been any one of the crewmen. Most sailors had some knowledge of sewing. They often had the spare time and it was a useful skill. Clothing could be mended. You could make special items like bags, pouches, belts or purses. Or even stitch money into your jacket as a hiding place. Secondly, tailors seem to have been relatively common aboard pirate ships. Woods Rogers had six tailors on board his vessel, assigned to making special winter clothing. Dampier described his buccaneer crew as consisting of sawyers, carpenters, joiners, brickmakers, bricklayers, shoemakers, tailors, etc. For what reason? Fluctuating wages could be one. In the 17th century, piracy wasn't always understood as a permanent profession, or even a lifestyle. More so a temporary phase in a long career at sea. Thirdly, you could have assigned sailmakers to the task. Normally, these guys had their hands full making and repairing the sails. Lastly, pirates could have used women to make their flags. Sewing was especially known among women, and pirates often had wives or sweethearts on land who could prepare their flags if they asked nicely. In some cases, women were brought aboard and used for similar purposes. Rogers had several women aboard, working as laundresses, cooks and seamstresses. When the flag maker had been assigned, they would have to decide what type of flag they wanted to make. Ships in the period flew three types of flags. Ancients, jacks and pennants. Ancients were the biggest and they were huge. Of course, the size depended on the size of the ship, but they could be as big as a sail. The ensign of a sloop could be 7 feet by 10 feet. They were always mounted from a staff on the vessel's stern. Pirates have been documented as using both national ensigns and black ones. Black ensigns were flown by pirates like Francis Spriggs and Blackbeard. Samuel Bellamy used both. He attacked one ship using the English ensign and another flying his black one, with a skeleton blowing a trumpet. All pirates might not have afforded a unique design and would have to do with a jack instead. Being smaller than ensigns, a typical jack could measure 5 feet by 7 feet. Formerly they were flown from the jack staff mounted on the bowsprit, but pirates would often break the rules and fly their jack from the main or fore topmast. Lastly, there were pennants, long, small, triangular flags, traditionally used to indicate the status of a ship. Commodores used them to highlight their rank, and they distinguished English privateers from civilians. Pirates used red, black, and sometimes white pennants. They might have a symbol, but only sometimes. It was common to mix and match national and black colors of the different types. Richard Taylor was described as flying an English ensign, a black flag from the main topmast, and a red flag from the foremast. A similar system was deployed by Bartholomew Roberts. After deciding on what type of flag they wanted, the pirates had to acquire materials. Most flags in the period were made from wool bunting, also called tammy. It is a high quality form of wool, valued for its lightness and strength, useful properties for a flag. Owing to its manufacture, it would also have a glaze to it. The symbols would have been made separately. You'd cut out pieces from different cloth and stitch them onto the main flag. You can imagine that a lot of these symbols would have been crudely made and asymmetrical. The process of making the flag would have been much easier if multiple people worked on the parts, with one person assembling them. Especially prestigious was for the pirates to get their hands on a silk flag. Silk was, of course, much more expensive and difficult to acquire. The benefit of silk is that you can paint on it, allowing it to produce more elaborate and detailed symbols. So it could have been prettier, provided the pirates had the skill and patience. William Moody was described as flying a black ensign painted with a white man, stabbing a red heart with three arrows. Moody simultaneously flew a smaller jack, painted with a heart pierced by an arrow. 
silk flags were also described as being used by Bartholomew Roberts and Philip Lyne. Others were too lazy to paint their silk and simply used black silk pennants. And then there's the question of color. Pirate flags are near exclusively depicted as black with white symbols. But in eyewitness descriptions, the exact colors are often left ambiguous. Thomas Nichols was described as flying a flag with a dart and a bleeding heart. We don't know the color of the background, the heart, or the dart, or the blood. Maybe a black background, a white dart, and a red heart. Maybe all the symbols were white, or red. From a distance, a lot of varying colors could appear as another. Yellow and other off-white colors could appear as white. Indeed, the colors of the symbols are rarely often stated. They could have been white, red, yellow, or whatever else. Several pirates used white backgrounds with black symbols. They might have used this combination to indicate their French allegiance. The flag of France at the time was white, often with the yellow fleur-de-lis, but also because black dye was expensive. It could only be made reliably from logwood, a material mostly found in the Yucatan Peninsula. Pirates were heavily involved in the logwood trade. It was common for pirates to retire as logwood cutters. They would also rob logwood ships, recruit logwood cutters as crewmen, or even steal from them. Owing to the cost of logwood, the fine black dye could only be afforded by the upper classes, and only really used for niche purposes like evening or funeral wear. However, owing to their connection to the logwood cutters, some pirates may have had easier access to the dye. But from afar, a lot of colors could be interpreted as black. If the pirates couldn't obtain a perfect sable, they might have used a substitute. According to a general history, Howell Davis initially hoisted a dirty tarpaulin. A tarpaulin is a waterproof cloth often used to protect objects, or even as a cloak. Howell's tarpaulin would have been a dirty grey, but from afar would have sufficed as a pirate flag. Another captain named Charles Harris flew a dark blue flag with a skeleton stabbing a heart. Some pirates may have used grey flags, or even brown. Some might have used dark red, or just regular red, a comparably cheap and available color. When the pirates had their flag maker, materials and colors selected, they needed to choose their symbols. Pirate flags were flown as a form of terror tactic, to unnerve or even scare their victims into submission. Also as an internal defiance against death. The color black was of course the color of death, so it was most logical to use symbols associated with it, or even violence in general. The symbols of death included skulls, crossed bones, hourglasses, skeletons, hearts pierced by arrows, and trumpets. For inspiration, Pats would have looked at and memorized contemporary depictions of these symbols. They were found everywhere. Tombstones were often designed with skulls and crossed bones, the skulls facing a variety of directions. It is also common to find hourglasses on tombstones, sometimes bewinged. They indicate that time is fleeting and death is drawing close. Symbols of death were also drawn and illustrated. When a death was recorded in naval logs or church records, it might be accompanied by a skull, or even a skeleton. Skellingtonies are often depicted with darts or arrows. In the period, death itself was imagined as a skeleton stabbing your heart when taking your soul away. Some skeletons are seen wielding scythes or shovels, but I've never heard of any pirate flags depicted with them. Attendees of funerals were often presented with funeral tickets. On this example we can find pretty much all of the symbols used on pirate flags. Hourglasses, skulls and bones, skeletons and trumpets. The trumpet was associated with death due to the trumpets blown when entering the gates of heaven. It was also common for individuals to wear rings or jewelry with symbols of death, so called memento mori, a reminder of death's constant presence. On some of these rings we find symbols blatantly copied by pirates skeletons holding darts and hourglasses. Pirates also used symbols not traditionally associated with death, but whose meaning were still obvious. These mostly included weaponry. Most often we find swords, sometimes held by an arm. Crossed swords were quite uncommon. Olivier Levasseur had such a flag. Several flags had a sword held by a man, or a skeleton. Another flag had a man holding a sword and pistol, one of the weapons favored by pirates. Howell Davis had a flag with a cannon and a sword, and one part flag had a powder horn. A similar flag with a powder horn was depicted on a ship's flag from the 1750s. We will never know for certain what part flags looked like, 
but by tracing contemporary depictions, we can get an idea of what most likely inspired them. This is what I did when making the designs for my Teespring store. I took eyewitness descriptions of pirate flags, looked at various contemporary depictions of the described symbols, and combined different aspects of these depictions into several designs. I do think most pirate flags would have been uglier, more crude and less detailed, but I wanted symbols that were both historically authentic and aesthetically pleasing, so I went for a sort of middle ground between realism, detail and authenticity. All of the designs come in different color variations, which I think pirates could have used. The choice of symbols were voted on in a public poll, and are now available on several products in the Teespring store. If you're interested or just want to support the channel for something nice in return, you can access the store right here on the video page, or in the description box below. Please, enjoy! As usual, thank you to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to my videos and can watch them without ads. And if you want to interact with fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Cheerio!